All right, good morning. This is Vice Admiral Tom Moore, the commander of the Naval Sea Systems Command, and you are listening to the Engineering Duty Officer School's podcast. For this inaugural episode, I'd like to provide some insights and thoughts into attribute pyramids gener generated by the Engineering Duty Officer School. My first topic, I'd like to talk about developing others. In this topic, I'm going to provide you with a leadership approach that I use to develop future ED leaders, and I'm going to give you some tips on what you should do to help move people that are in, going into leadership positions. So first, let's talk, let's talk about a leadership approach. I think for all leaders, the most valuable commodity that we all have is time. Time is the one thing that you cannot create more of. And so if you want to know what's important to a leader, watch where they spend their time. And too often, I think, in the day-to-day -day business of what we do, we get busy and we spend less time on leadership and more time on the tactical day-to-day -day things that we're doing and be well served to spend a lot more time on the leadership thing. So first thing you have to do is make sure you're spending time in this particular area if you want to develop future leaders. Now let me give you a couple of examples of things I think you need to do um, from an approach to developing future leaders. First thing is you have to be able to set an example for other to follow. You should be a strong mentor and be willing to talk to people on a regular basis. When I talk about setting an example to follow, I'm talking about things like having a strong ethical and moral compass that cannot be questioned, a strong vision for where you would like to take the organization. You have to be somebody that leads by example. Uh, you have to walk the, the talk, so to speak, which means uh, that uh, if you are going to preach to your staff on a daily basis that work-life balance is important, and you yourself better darn well have work-life balance in your life. One of the things that I often hear at the ED school when I go talk is, hey, we hear from our leaders all the time that they need to have work-life balance, but when we ask them whether they have work-life balance, they all say no. And I can tell you uh, with 100% to certainty that I have work-life balance, and I think it's extremely important that you set that example for your workforce. The other thing I think from a leadership approach, uh, you have to be able to, you know, how you treat people is really, really important. So not only do you have to set priorities and be a demanding leader, but you have to treat people, you know, properly and treat them with respect. And that doesn't mean you can't be a demanding boss, but you can't be hard on people. If you do those things, that's really, really important. On the, uh, in terms of how you develop future leaders, I think the first thing is, as le all leaders, you've got to be able to identify early on who those leaders are and be willing to invest time with them. Be demanding with them, but not hard, and then make sure you create an alignment with them so that and empower them for success. Uh, I'll come back to this in a later topic, but uh, empowerment is extremely important. We all want to be empowered to do our job, but I'll tell you this right up front, that empowerment without alignment is anarchy. You gotta be able to have alignment. People have to be pulling in the same direction before you can empower them to do work. So in terms of approaching the development of future leaders, I think it's really, really important to create that alignment and empower them for success. Challenge them to think differently about all the problems. Uh, challenge them to, to challenge all the assumptions on how you do business today. Uh, allow your workforce to take targeted risk and learn from their failures. And then allow them to figure out how to stop doing things that are adding no value to the work they do on a daily basis. You do those other things, then you'll be able to develop your future leaders. In terms of some specific tips I would give people for those moving into a leadership position today, I think it's pretty simple. One, you got to set a vision. Where do you want to take the organization? Write down what you want to accomplish during the time that you're going to be in the job. And then make sure you set priorities. Focus on those on priorities uh, is very, very important. You'll hear me say this all the time. Nothing's, if everything's equally important, then nothing is important. You have to set priorities and you have to relentlessly focus on those priorities going forward. If you don't do that, then people will be confused about what's important in the organization and they won't we'll be working on the most important things. The other thing I would tell you is make sure you find a mentor yourself and get feedback routinely on what you're doing. If you can do that, that's critically important. And the last tip I would give anybody that's taken over a leadership position today is to be humble. Humility, I think, is, the, is leadership's greatest trait and a lot of people, when I talk about humility, think that means you have to be quiet and stand in the back, and, and that's not true at all. 
Humble means you don't take credit for what's going on in the organization, but I think humility most importantly means this. Humility means you're willing to consider that your very, very closely held beliefs may not in fact be right, and that you're willing to consider there may be a better path to go about doing those things. If you do those things from a leadership perspective, setting a vision, write down what you want to accomplish, set priorities, focus on those priorities relentlessly, find yourself a mentor, and lead with humility, you'll do exactly what we need to do uh, as leaders with the engineering duty committee. And if you follow those things and build those into how you mentor other people, you'll do a great job of developing future leaders in the engineering duty officer community. Uh, for my second topic, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about strategic thinking. And if you look at the slides that the EDO school has presented, they, the bottom says strategic thinking is formulate objectives and priorities, implement plans consistent with long-term interest of the organization and global environment, and capitalize on opportunities and manage risk. Let me talk a little bit about strategic thinking. Now, I don't, you, know, you may be sitting there and saying, hey, I'm only lieutenant. Strategic thinking's not in my game plan. I think that's a big mistake for all of us. Well, there's a lot of uh, people that think that strategic thinking only applies to the senior officers at the senior levels of the organization, and that's not true. While we all work in a tactical environment on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it's critically important that we have a strategic plan for what we're going to accomplish going forward. Now, your sphere of influence may be different depending on if you're an 03 or an 09, but nonetheless, you should, it's a good starting point to have a strategy for what you want to accomplish at all levels of the organization. The first thing you want to do in your strategy is make sure that you align your strategy with that of your chain of command. Um, that should start by a, a clear understanding of the top levels of what the Department of Defense is doing all the way down to your individual organization. So whether you're a lieutenant or a lieutenant commander or commander or captain, some basic understanding of the national defense strategy, the CNO's design for maintaining maritime superiority, and the NAFC campaign plan to expand the advantage is critically important because those are the strategic direction that the Department of Defense all the way down to NAFC uh, is going to take. And so back to my previous discussion that I had in the Developing Others section, empowerment without alignment is anarchy. So if you want to empower people to go do work, you've got to create that alignment. And the only way you can create that alignment is to know what your boss wants to get accomplished. Once you understand what that is, then set out and establish yourself a plan. I want to talk to you a little bit about the NAFC campaign plan and some thoughts that went into that and give you an example of how you might set some strategic uh, thinking here. The NAFC campaign plan has a mission and a vision. The mission of NAFC is pretty straightforward, design, build, and maintain ships and systems on time and on schedule for the United States Navy. The vision, on the other hand, is a little simpler, and I'll talk a little bit about more vision in my next uh, section of the podcast, but the NAFC vision is to expand the advantage. Within the NAFC campaign plan, uh, three priorities. If you remember what I said in developing others, if everything's equally important, nothing is important. So we have three main priorities in the NAFC campaign plan. The first priority is to the on-time delivery of ships and submarines. The second priority is to improve the, the reliability and capability of our ships and systems. And our third priority is cyber. Those three mission priorities have really been the same for the 40 plus months that I've been in the job. And I think consistency in that area is important. The, those three priorities are, sub, are supported by three foundational elements, uh, which is people, uh, creating a high velocity learning environment, and then also having a culture of affordability. So we chose within NAVC to have three mission priorities, but have those foundational elements because we felt that without people, without a culture of affordability, and without creating a, a high velocity learning environment, you couldn't be expected to accomplish the three missions that we laid out in the campaign plan. So as you sit and lay your plan out and do your strategic plan, I would, I would uh, uh, encourage you to align with the NAVC campaign plan and think about those sort of things. What is it you're trying to accomplish and align to those things and set your own priorities and your own foundational elements for how you'd like to get that accomplished. Let me give you a couple quick sea stories on how we've used this, the campaign plan to really go manage some major things that have occurred in the last uh, three plus years that I've been in the job. So if you go back to the strategic thinking slide, it talks about capitalizing on opportunities and managing risk. And I want to talk to you about the Fitzgerald and the John S. McCain because those are probably really two great examples of what we've tried to do here using the campaign plan 
uh, to manage the opportunities and the risk that came with the two collisions coming out of Fitzgerald and McCain. You have to look back on both of those to understand where we were coming out of those collisions. And the goal on the NAVC side of the house, as directed by the CNO, was to get both the ships back to the fleet as soon as possible with the most capability that we had. And so we had to take a look at both of those ships and make a determination of where we're going to put them and who was going to do the work and factor in what the cost was going to be and, and the schedule in terms of getting them back on track. In Fitzgerald's case, because of the extent of the damage, we made an early on decision that the capability to do that work in, uh, out in Yokosuka was probably not there. And the best uh, way to bring that back, uh, given the damage to the ship, was to give it to one of our new construction yards who had significant experience in the, in the uh, talking about the type of work we needed to do. And so we looked uh, both at Bath and uh, down at Ingalls and determined that we had the capacity to do the work at Ingalls and that they had recent work on DDGs, and that's where Fitzgerald went. On the Jonas McCain side of the house, uh, the, the damage was not as, as significant. Uh, there was a political optic as well to keep it and get it back as soon as possible. And we went and took a pretty close look, and SRF Yakuska was well capable of doing that work. And so we signed that work there. So uh, in both those cases, the, those projects have turned out to be eminently successful. The SRF Yakuska team, team has already re, uh, brought McCain back to schedule, and she's out in the fleet now. We should be very proud of that. And Fitzgerald is in the water and uh, starting to light off her equipment, and we expect to get her out to sea trials in February. But it's an opportunity where we took, used some of our strategic thinking in the NAFC campaign plan to go manage the opportunities and risk associated with those two ships. There's countless other stories along the line that I could talk about from the NAFC perspective, but those are two that are pretty good ones, I think, that fit into that scenario. The last section I want to talk to you about is vision. Uh, and the vision section, uh, if you go read from the slide, take a long-term view and build a shared vision with others, act as a catalyst for organizational change, influence others to translate vision into action. There's a couple of really important things in there before I get into my real marks. One, I think it, the first one is building a shared vision. Uh, back to my comments earlier about empowerment and alignment. If you don't have a shared vision where everybody's pulling in the same direction and a shared vision that somebody, everybody's bought into, it's pretty hard to create that alignment and then from there move on to the empowerment piece, which is critically important to any organization because without an empowered workforce, you're never going to be as good as you can possibly be. The other part of that is uh, translating vision into action. Uh, vision into action is critically important. We tend to focus a lot on activity, uh, and at the end of the day, the most important thing is not activity, but outcomes. And so uh, taking that vision and turning it into something you can go work on is critically important. So the vision really goes hand in hand with previously what I talked about with strategic thinking. Where do you want to be, say, six months, one year, two years, five years from now? And I would encourage you to think about this in two ways. Think about it from an organizational perspective. Where do you want the organization to be one, two, five years from now? But also you can apply this to your personal life, whether it's uh, your career itself or you're at home. Where do you want to be one, two, five years from now? And then set out and establish a plan to go get that done. And I think there's three really important attributes to a vision. And remember, vision is really describing where do you want to end up. Now, where is it that I want to go? In, the, in Covey's term, this is beginning with the end in mind. That's what that, that is what vision is for those, any of you who's had the chance to read Covey's Seven Habits, which is something of highly effective leaders, which is a book I would highly recommend you read. So I think a good vision has three attributes. One, it should describe a future state. Uh, two, it should be a challenging but achievable goal. If you make it so challenging that it's not possible to achieve, for instance, if you were to tell me, hey, I need you to run a sub four minute mile within the year, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time working on that because it's not something I can probably accomplish. And then I think it should be something you can remember because if you don't remember what the vision is, you're going to have a hard time getting after it. And I remember when I came into NAFC, the NAFC vision at the time was on the order of about 67 words. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't remember what the NAFC vision was. And so as my staff and I sat down and started to think about the mission and vision of NAFC, one of the first things they asked me was, hey, can you give me an example of a good vision? And I said, yeah, here's one that I can remember. And it was a very small rental car company in the early 90s, and their vision was to get out of other. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, what the heck does get out of other mean? But if you think about it from a business perspective, almost all businesses are concerned about market share. And if you look at these pie charts on market share, whether it's fast food or rental cars or airlines, 
you'll take uh, rental cars, for example, you'd see Avis, you'd see Hertz, uh, you'd see National, you'd see Budget. And on all those pie charts, there's that one little sliver, which is for everybody else. And it's usually labeled other. And so this particular rental car company's goal was to get out of other. In other words, they wanted their name on the chart. It was described a future state. It was challenging, but achievable and something that they could remember. And so that rental car company back in 1990 was Enterprise, which is today the world's largest rental car company. And so while I'm not here to tell you that having a catchy vision statement will uh, get you to be Enterprise, it does uh, set that future state and something that everybody can rally around and align to. On the NAVC side of the house, uh, expand the advantage was really meant to, to really talk to the fact that in this world of great power competition with China and Russian, that we are in, that the, the capability gap between us and our near peer competitors has closed. And so therefore, our job is to expand that advantage back out. And that uniquely and, and really does describe what NAVC and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in delivering combat capability to the fleet to expand that tactical advantage and that strategic advantage back out. So if you want to go look at, you know, from, a, from how a strategic vision changed how NAVC has approached challenges, all you have to do is go look at mission priority number one. Mission priority number one under the campaign plan with the vision I just told you about is the on-time delivery of ships and submarines and really has driven everything that NAVC has done in the 40 plus months that I've been in the job. And you can look at it from an individual ship basis, how do you get a ship out of an availability, but from a big picture perspective, from where I'm working at the strategic level, it's really two major things uh, in the naval shipyards and one in the private sector that I want to talk to you about here briefly. On the naval shipyard side of the house, it was pretty clear <clears throat> that we had more work than we had capacity. And so the first thing we had to set out to do on the naval shipyard side of the house was to build the capacity to do the work. And that meant growing the naval shipyards from 33,850 up to 36,700 that we're at today. That was a strategic vision that required us to create alignment and with the Pentagon in order to get the resources that we needed. The other thing that was pretty clear to us was that if you wanted to deliver the ships on time, not only did you need the people, you needed a uh, shipyards uh, that were aligned and were set up in order to do work more effectively and productively than they are today. That was the catalyst for what is today known as the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Plan, which is a 20 uh, billion, 20, 21 billion, 20, 20 year effort to really improve the dry docks, the capital uh, equipment in our naval shipyards, and then build the shipyards in a way that they could be more productive. On the private sector side of the house, uh, we had the same thing. We were not delivering ships out of time uh, out of the private sector, and you could say, uh, go just go beat on the contractor and tell him he needs to deliver on time. What it was pretty clear is that our strategy for how we were doing that from an acquisition standpoint wasn't working. And, and so what we have done over the last couple of years is recognize that industry needed a long-term, stable, predictable plan to deliver the work. And at the same time, we needed cost-conscious, fixed-price work in order to get that work done. And so that really has led to the changes that we've made in the private sector and how we're contracting for that work today, reducing QA checkpoints by 50 percent, and there's a long list of things that go down there. The major point I'm trying to make here with you is, from a strategic thinking side of the house, is you take that vision and that strategy, and then you develop the tactical things that you're going to work on each and every day. If you can do that, then ultimately it'll be successful. You start by developing people, you have a strategy for what you want to accomplish and a vision for doing that, and then you get out there each and every day and execute that. If you do those three things on a daily basis, you'll be successful. It may seem hard, but I can promise you, if you start with those three basic building blocks, you too can build your a plan to develop your people, have a vision for the work that you want to get accomplished, lay out a strategy that at the end of the day, in this world of great power competition, will help expand the advantage. Okay, in closing, so thanks for the time today. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, there was a lot more to talk about in those three uh, particular topics, but I hope it whetted your appetite. And if you have more things you'd like to discuss in those areas, I would encourage you to engage with your leadership and with the Engineering Duty Officer School. And please feel free to send me a note at thomas.j.more5 at navy.mil. The best part of my day is getting emails from you. And if you send me an email, I promise to respond to you. We're still looking for a community champion to take the lead on future podcasts. If you're interested, reach out to Commander Vet Davis at the Engineering Duty Officer School, and he'll help set that up. 
We're also looking for topics that you're most interested in going forward, so please pass those on to the EDO school and pass those on to your flag and, and senior leadership within the, within the ED community. We look forward to hearing back from you. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Keep charging and win them all.